On December 22nd, 1988, it's believed that a bomb concealed in a Toshiba Bomb Beat SF-16 beatbox was loaded onto a plane in Malta that would be connecting with Pan Am 103 in London after stopping in Frankfurt. And the radio was half a kilogram of Semtex, the size of a small cake, a virtually undetectable plastic explosive sold to the Libyans by Czechoslovakia, concealed in clothes, purchased in Malta, and packed in the case. The timer used was crude and said to go off at a specific time, not altitude, which is the usual case with such bombs. The suitcase and the clothing inside had been linked to a former Libyan intelligence officer who had also worked at the airport in Malta. The suitcase was believed to be put on the plane in Malta. He was not on the passenger list, which airport officials in Malta deny, saying that every piece of luggage was linked to a passenger. The suitcase was not scanned because Malta is considered a low-risk area. Meaning quite simply, when the Boeing 747, known as Maid of the Seas, took off from Heathrow Airport, its fate, and those who were on her, was sealed. By all accounts, the cabin crew on Pan Am 103 were one of the best. And either three in the flight deck could have landed the plane in any number of emergency circumstances. A supplemental report of service information 340204. It's believed that three to five seconds after the explosion, the cone or the nose of the plane was torn off was temporarily held on by the communication cables that ran from the tail of the plane to the nose. All three of the cabin crew were still strapped into their seats, one of them holding on to a phone. Coroners believed that the crew in the first class section would have survived the explosion, blacking out briefly, but then waking up for their two minute descent. The Federal Aviation Association concluded that no emergency procedures were started by the pilots, and upon the explosion, communications were severed instantly, which would have been the cables holding on the nose. 100 milliseconds of white noise was the last sound that came from Pan Am 103. The explosion punched a 20 centimeter hole in the side of the aircraft, just under the P in Pan Am. The nose of the aircraft was ripped off, carrying the pilots and part of the first class section and propelled into the third engine. Removing it where it landed about a mile from Lockerbie. The fuselage kept moving forward until it reached 19,000 feet and then its drop was almost vertical. At the moment the white noise was heard, five separate radar echoes were seen moving in an outward motion. Flight investigators surmised after viewing the bodies that over half the passengers on Flight 103 survived the initial breakup, but were killed when they hit the ground. I guess they could tell that. A British Airways pilot flying from London to Glasgow reported to be what he believed an inferno on the ground possibly caused by a bomb. The rear fuselage, along with the landing gear, and the majority of the passengers, landed on Rosebank Crescent. Firefighters and would-be rescuers who arrived on the scene said the bodies were hanging from trees, like Christmas decorations. the wreckage have formed on two residential areas. The front fuselage landed on Sherwood Crescent on top of three homes, liquefying three families consisting of 11 people, creating a large crater. No bodies were ever found. Firefighters noted that the iron grade fences were melted into puddles like molten lava. A woman 
who was returning from Christmas shopping with her son, said that it appeared to be raining limbs as a leg fell from the heavens and smashed through her car window. Body parts and wreckage was found up to eight miles away from the city center with a farmer finding a woman's head in his chicken coop with the rest of the body found nearly a mile away still sitting in his seat holding a baby the timer on the bomb was believed to be set while it was over the sea so it would be untraceable but because of delays the timed explosive detonated over land not only dooming those in the air but those in Lockerbie and while the explosion was relatively small and in the aircraft's hold there was the difference between the inside and the outside pressure to rip the plane apart investigators recorded that it's quite possible that the nose of the plane glided towards earth in a similar fashion to a leaf fallen from a tree It was while investigators were still looking for a cause that it was leaked that the US government and Pan Am had knowledge of a potential bomb threat. It's when they had some splaining to do. On December 5, 1988, an unidentified individual telephoned the US Embassy in Helsinki and stated that sometime within the next two weeks there would be a bombing attempt against a Pan American aircraft flying from Frankfurt to the US. According to the caller, an, an unidentified person in Helsinki would unwittingly take the device to Frankfurt and eventually onto the U.S. bound flight. I guess a lot of people wanted to know why the U.S. government only warned their own employees who were flying that route. And why Pan Am warned no one. It seemed that something didn't smell right in Finland, and it weren't that fish that they ate. Sometimes by going public, you achieve, you, you, you give uh, uh, undue attention to what the terrorist wants to call attention to. And so often it's best to handle these matters by aborting the threat. But if, if you want me to say that if we have specific in information that a specific flight was going to be specifically targeted and that information had any credibility to it, and then I think widespread notices should be given and people should well know uh, that they were putting their lives at risk. I feel that the American citizens should have been warned about a possible incident as American diplomats were. I think all the precautions that could be taken were taken with regard to warning the airline and all, but if you stop to think about it, such a public statement with nothing more to go on than an anonymous telephone call, you'd literally have closed down the air traffic in the world. Mr. Reagan's suggestion, though, is that um, you care more about the diplomats who you did warn than the American public. No, that, as I say, I think that would have been a virtually impossible thing to do on the basis of that telephone call. And then when, if ever, would there be a revival on all airlines. The American government's excuse was the same as the airliners, that not enough details were known. But some would say that a Pan Am flight leaving from Frankfurt due to be blown up in a two-week window is all the evidence that you need. And when investigators finally confirmed that it were a bomb, I guess people wanted answers. We established the two parts of the metal luggage pallet framework show conclusive evidence of a detonating high explosive. And while several Arabic groups stepped forward to claim responsibility, a lot of people believed that it were Yasser Arafat and the PLO, or someone within the organization trying to mess up the peace talks with Reagan and the US. Well, the words must be matched by performance. And if they're not, why, <laughs> we're back uh, where we started. But then again, a lot of the family weren't buying what the government and the airlines were selling. It's a tragedy. I don't care if it was a diplomat or a student like me. It's all equal in my eyes. No one, no one deserves to die or anything. Thank God I'm home. Thank God I'm home and I'm safe and 
but I wasn't one of the unlucky ones. <laughs> Martin Bell in Washington. Tonight in London, the United States Ambassador Charles Price confirmed that his embassy had received a warning on the 9th of December of a terrorist threat. But it was more than just the family and the friends of the dead that were in mourning and asking why. It were those who got off that plane at Heathrow to transfer to another flight, while all those others, including 20 small children, want. Very difficult to, to have any message for, for, for the people of Lockerbie, apart from my uh, sincere condolences for what has happened. I suppose that statistically, something like this has got to happen at some stage on a time. It is the most sad and unfortunate. Despite being warned by the government not to travel, almost every family member of the victims came to Lockerbie, inundating the small town. But it's chance and circumstance that is woven throughout the fabric of the Pan Am 103 tragedy. John Cummick was due home for Christmas from a business trip in London, and he thought he'd surprise his young family by coming home early. It was an appearance that he'd never make. Such is the surprise that his wife didn't even know while watching the news of the tragedy unfolding. She recognized an attaché case, the same case she'd only just given her husband for the wedding anniversary. John Cummick was sitting in business class in C3A in the nose cone of the plane. A farmer, tending his fields at the end of the day, saw what he believed to be a doll. When he picked it up, there was a dead child with not even a bruise on her. As his son had taken the car into town, the farmer walked two miles to the makeshift mortuary, handing the baby over to paramedics as he sobbed uncontrollably. A registered nurse coming home from drinks with friends saw what she believed to be another reveler lying in a fetal position crying. When she approached to help, she was horrified to discover it was a flight attendant from the plane. In the middle of nowhere, by the time she found help, the woman had died. Investigators believe that there were three groups of passengers. Those who had died instantly from the explosion, those strapped to their seats who died from impact, and those, for whatever reason, who survived the fall, but died shortly afterwards. It was when an independent investigator, representing family members, tested how long it would take to free fall 31,000 feet to the ground, that the family shuddered in horror, a horror that cannot be described of a person spending two to three minutes strapped into their seat. Some of them with a loved one, a child seated next to them, knowing they were plummeting to their death. Not everything was so cut and dry on Pan Am Flight 103. It's reported that there were six government agents on the plane, including Matthew Gannon, the CIA's deputy station chief in Beirut, Lebanon, and five others who cannot be identified. Known as the Secret Six, their bodies were picked up from the makeshift morgue in Lockerbie and transported under guard privately from the country. Conspiracy theorists believe that they may have been the real target of the doomed airliner. Others have suggested that the CIA knew about the bomb, but didn't say anything because it was part of some government sanctioned hit. But as it's classified information, we'll never know. Clearly moved, the Prime Minister spoke of the scenes at the crash sites. It is even worse in daylight than it looked on television at night. Now you can see the full enormity of the damage and the extent of it, uh, and the way in which there's pieces of aircraft and twisted metal scattered over a wide area, and the number of houses that are damaged. Um, and the, the people in them must have wondered just whatever was happening, as indeed the people in the aircraft must have 
had this, well, it was just terrible. Over a thousand police officers carried out fingertip searches over an eight mile radius for three months, retrieving over four million pieces. And that's not even including the body parts and chunks of human flesh. It's just a plane. A plane that was never supposed to be found because the bomb was supposed to have exploded over the sea and ended up on the seabed with the eels and the Spanish bullion. It was after a three year investigation with the Scottish police led by the FBI that they came to the conclusion that the bomb was planted by two Libyans. An outcome that many people were unsatisfied with. Many felt too convenient. There have been no survivors reported from the crashed aircraft and we're waiting for Dr. Hill, who is the on-site medical officer, to give us a, an official stand down. With a small town with only two police officers and one ambulance, emergency services converged from all over the UK. But with 270 dead and over 256 wounded, some would say it was more of a cleanup operation. It was three years after the explosion that investigators announced that they knew who the bombers of Pan Am 103 were. Oh, no.